the history of the world is one filled with battles and conquests. In other words, many nations of the world have had to fight battles and also go through phases of either colonialism or slavery to another nation just so they can earn their freedom. Hello and welcome to another exciting time in government class. I am Paul Okeke and today we want to look at a very interesting topic and also a very interesting thing. Our theme today is pre-colonial administration in Nigeria. And under this, we want to look at constitutional development in Nigeria. By the end of the lesson, you should be able to mention the pre-independent constitutions of Nigeria, highlight some features of the pre-independent constitutions of Nigeria, and state some problems with the pre-independent constitutions of Nigeria. Nigeria, with its unique political realities is often described as being in its fourth republic. By fourth republic, we mean that Nigeria is an independent nation or perhaps was declared an independent nation for the fourth time in its brief history. The 1999 constitution declares Nigeria a fourth republic. But before the 1999 constitutions, Nigeria had several other constitutions. These constitutions are categorized into pre-independence constitutions and independence or post-independence constitutions. Pre-independence constitutions are constitutions which date from 1914, when Nigeria was amalgamated or joined, till 1956. These constitutions are said to be constitutions which came before 1960, when Nigeria got her independence. Also, we shall be looking at the features of these constitutions and also see the problems with each of them and why they had to be changed from time to time. Nigeria, like several other West African nations and African nations, was said to be colonized by Britain. Britain was said to gain full access into the Nigerian territory or colony in the 1800s when they fought battles and then captured many parts of the country, with the last victory being the northern parts of the country. After a successful capture of the various territories of Nigeria, Britain was said to have established a colony in Lagos from where they administered the affairs of other regions of the country. In 1914, when Lord Lugard was said to have finally conquered the northern protectorate, which is the northern regions of the country, he was said to be appointed the first governor general of Nigeria. Now, mind you, Nigeria was not known as Nigeria at this point in time. What Nigeria was known as was the Southern and Northern Protectorates. Now, under the Southern Protectorates, we had the West and also the East. Then we had the Mid, West, Middle West, and other parts of the Southern region. But Lagos was said to have been given its own political identity. And this period, Lagos was known as a colony, while there was Southern protectorate and northern protectorate. The implication of this is that eventually Lagos would be seen as having its own unique set of laws and constitutions, whereas other parts of the country were said to be governed by a different set of laws or constitution. But there were several constitutions or body of laws which were enacted by the British to enable them to rule Nigeria effectively. So one thing you should first of all get straight is that these constitutions or body of laws were not put in place so that the peoples of Nigeria would be able to harness their resources and come to nationhood. These constitutions which were enacted by the British to help them administer an indirect rule in Nigeria successfully are said to be the 1914 Frederick Lugard Constitution, the 1922 Clifford Constitution and a few others. We shall also be looking at their features and the problems which were associated with them and why they were jettisoned for an upgraded constitution eventually. The first of these constitutions is the Frederick Lugard Constitution of 1914. Prior to 1914, Nigeria was not called Nigeria. As we said earlier, the region or the territory was known as the Southern and Northern Protectorates. In other words, they were two distinct and different entities. They were not people who saw themselves as united 
that they did see themselves as one. However, from time to time, they did interact with one another, bad trade and other means. But until the British came and discovered that for them to successfully administer the affairs of these regions, which they had successfully captured in battle, they had to bring them together as one. Or maybe pretend to them that they had a lot of similarities more than they had differences. In 1914, Britain appointed Frederick Lugard, who eventually became a lord, to be the first governor general of the southern and northern protectorates. It was Lord Lugard who eventually named Nigeria what it is now known as. But when Lord Lugard was appointed, he found out that there were different political realities and unique challenges with these different parts of the country. And one of the major reasons why he had to amalgamate the country or join the different regions as one was because of uneven distribution of natural resources. The Northern Protectorate, prior to the joining of these regions, had some difficulties and challenges administering their own affairs because there were not much resources in the region. So for Britain to successfully mitigate or find a way around this problem, it was important for them to join the nation. Now, this has been seen by many political scholars and thinkers as a quick and escapist way to evade challenges because Britain was reluctant to finance the Northern region or Northern Protectorate from their own coffers or purse. So they discovered enough resources in the South which can go round and then decided that for the benefit of the North, the nation had to be amalgamated. So you have it. Frederick Lugard amalgamates the nation as one and then a new constitution was drafted. But this constitution was not drafted after the amalgamation. It was actually in process while the amalgamation was ongoing. So it was this constitution that captured the amalgamation of the nation. When Lord Lugard amalgamated Nigeria as one, Lagos, however, still retained its colonial status. In other words, Lagos was still seen as a primary colony. A colony basically is a settlement where foreign powers that have captured a territory build a small city from which they interact with every other part of the territory they have captured. So Lagos was the main residence or the city of residence for many colonial powers who captured Nigeria. So when Lord Lugard amalgamated the nation, this constitution, which was later referred to as the 1914 Frederick Lugard Constitution, was put into effect to administer the various regions of the country, except for the Lagos colony. Now let us look at some of the features of this constitution that Lord Lugard promulgated or enacted and see some of the features that made it not to stand the test of time because what we are saying is that just a few years down the line, this constitution would be jettisoned for the Clifford Constitution of 1922. The first feature of the Lord Lugard Constitution was that it amalgamated the Southern and Northern Protectorates as one. In other words, these regions that were distinct and different from each other were now joined to be seen as one. Like we said earlier, this was so that it would be easier for Lord Lugard to effectively administer the affairs of the territory. Another feature of the 1914 constitution was that Lagos had its own distinct body of law, while the Southern and Northern Protectorates that have now been joined had a different body of law. For Lagos, a legislative colony was responsible for making laws for this city, while the Governor General, Frederick Lugard, was responsible for making laws for the Southern and Northern Protectorates. Another feature was that the Legislative Council, which Lord Lugard formed to help him administer the affairs and also help in decision-making process, was made up of 23 Europeans. That is, a Legislative Council was formed to help administer the affairs of the new Nigeria, but a Nigerian was not in this council. 
The 23 members of this council were all Europeans. Think about it. You go to a new place, you fight a battle, you conquer the people there, and then the best way you think that you can administer the affairs of the people and make them happy with you is to bring foreigners to make laws for them. Now the question is, these foreigners, do they understand the cultures of these people whom you have just captured? And even if they did, do they identify as one of them? Now, while slavery had all of its negativities, one of the takeaways from it was that people were able to learn the cultures of other people because while you go to a place, you are forced and also encouraged to interact with the people, to know more about them, know what their fears are, their weaknesses, and also their strengths, their aspirations. When you get to know all of these things, you are just making yourself welcomed into the culture of these people. But Frederick Lugard had other options or maybe had a different thought and belief. Frederick Lugard formed this legislative council that were made up of 23 Europeans. Now, these 23 members of the legislative council were known as the official members who helped Frederick Lugard in the administration of the affairs of the nation. There were also 13 unofficial members. Seven of these unofficial members were also Europeans while six were Nigerians. Yeah, don't let that fool you. Six of them may have been Nigerians, but they perhaps were just figureheads. They didn't have any input, neither did they contribute to any decision-making process. He just did that so that the people wouldn't feel like as though they didn't have representation in the Legislative Council. You may ask, how do I know? Was I there? Of course, that's because the next constitution, which was after the Frederick Lugard constitution was majorly as a result of the fact that there was no indigenous representation in his council. In other words, Frederick Lugard had created a 1914 constitution, but there was no indigenous representation. That is, the people whom the constitution was made for were not even consulted, neither were their opinions sought to know what a constitution would be like for them. Now, this constitution, as much as it was relatively the first official constitution of Nigeria, had several challenges. One of them we just mentioned was that there was no indigenous representation. And you can expect that if there is no indigenous representation, people would always agitate from time to time to be represented. That is, Nigerians at some point realized that we can no longer sit while some people make laws for us. We need to be a part of the process. However, the motives behind the people who also want to be a part of the process was also to be questioned. Now, while all of these were the major problems and challenges of the 1914 constitution, there was now a body known as the West African Congress. The West African Congress did not pressure Lord Lugard. No, they left him to perhaps just do his thing. But the next governor general who succeeded Frederick Lugard was Sir Hugh Clifford. Sir Hugh Clifford was pressured by the then West African Congress to create different constitutions for the different West African subject states. In other words, there were many African states or West African states like Nigeria, Ghana, who were all under the rule and reign of Britain. The West African Congress ensured that all of them had their different constitutions because they were all different peoples and for you to have a unifying constitution for these different people would only mean that problems, tensions, would arise from time to time. So the West African Congress then pressured Sahid Clifford to draft independent constitutions for the various subject states of Britain. When this body pressured Sahid Clifford in 1919, when he became the Governor General, it was until three years later, which was in 1922, when a new constitution known as the Sir Hugh Clifford Constitution was created. The exclusion of Nigerians from the decision and political making process was the major undoing of the Frederick Lugard Constitution of 1914. In a way to resolve this, Sir Hugh Clifford, then pressured by the West African Congress, had to organize a constitutional conference for people to be able to come and then talk about their opinions and their aspirations for a new constitution. However, it was not as objective as it was expected to be. 
because after the constitution was drafted, some of the major features of the 1914 constitution still reflected in the new Clifford constitution. Now let us look at some of the features of the Clifford constitution and also let us see why the constitution did not last longer as expected. One of the major features of the Clifford constitution was that it created the first electoral system in Nigeria. So yes, the Clifford constitution made provisions for Nigerians to participate in the decision-making process, but do not rejoice yet because it was more or less like a trap, a decoy. According to this constitution, an electoral system was created. So this means that Nigerians could participate in the electoral process. In other words, they could contest for offices or public posts, but only those which were allowed by Britain. Not just that. There were also some criteria put in place for those who would contest for elections to meet. For example, £100 was required to be the minimum amount a person who was contesting for any public office was to have. I mean, think about it. You finally give the people the opportunity to participate in the decision-making process, but then you go ahead and put some stringent processes or conditions which they must meet. And then, mind you, at this time, there were practically few people in Nigeria who could afford £100 to even take care of their own families or send their children to school. How much more having £100 to spare for electoral purposes? So this feature and so many others, which we'll also see, were some of the reasons the Clifford Constitution was jettisoned, like the Frederick Constitution. Another feature was that an executive council was created with an all European membership. Do not forget that the major reason why the Frederick constitution was jettisoned was because it didn't have indigenous people ably represented in its legislative council. Now, Clifford repeated the same mistake. Clifford created an executive council, but there was no Nigerian in this council. I mean, like we said earlier, if you create such council, you should have people represent those whom constitutions were made for. But no, it seems there is just a general or there is a similarity in thought or thought pattern amongst the various governor generals of Nigeria from point to another where they all think that for Nigeria to be governed successfully, the councils which were enacted would have to comprise of just Europeans and non-Nigerians. Now, this is a bad political move because even if you want to keep ruling a people, you shouldn't just come, make it obvious that you don't want to have anything to do with them or their culture because a people's culture is basically what gives their life meaning. So for you to be able to win the support of the people, you should at least give them a form of representation in the decision-making process, make them feel important. But Clifford repeated Frederick's mistakes of creating an all-European council that would be in charge of making decisions for Nigeria. Lastly, it was that the constitution declared that the northern parts of the country, the northern region, would be ruled by promulgations. Promulgations are enactments, acts, which are basically spoken and not written. Promulgations are more effective in an authoritarian system where there is a king or a monarch. So, Decrees was said to be what the North would be governed by, while the South was to be governed by an established body of laws. So you see the disparity or the disunity in constitution or process of administering the affairs of a nation also led to this constitution being jettisoned for another constitution. But then it does not mean that there were not some positives from the constitution. Like we mentioned, in the beginning of our futures, we said that the constitution created the first electoral system in Nigeria. Regardless of whether the conditions put in place was considered impossible or unreachable by indigents, it was still a welcomed idea because it meant that going forward, it would only be about finding ways of ensuring that the conditions which were put in place would be lowered for the participation of indigents. Living the Clifford constitution, we have the Richard's Constitution. The Richard's Constitution was a direct upgrade from 
the Clifford Constitution. Like we mentioned earlier, there were some major problems with the Clifford Constitution. One of such was that the amount which was put in place for people to have before they would be able to participate in the electoral process, which is which was hundred pounds, was considered too high. At this time, there were barely few people in Nigeria who could boast of earning such amount, even annually. So that hundred pounds was considered too high. I mean, if you are going to let indigents participate, just let them participate. Don't make it difficult for them to do so. The Richard Constitution seemed, however, to think about this and find ways of ensuring that the conditions were lowered so that it would enable more participants from the various parts of Nigeria enter the decision-making process of their country. After all, it is their nation. While pressure was mounted on Sir Hugh Clifford by the then West African Congress to draft a new constitution that would mirror and reflect the realities of the new Nigerian people, Sir Richard was pressured by the educated elites of Nigeria. By educated elites, we mean those who had gotten access to Western education. So yes, these people felt that it was their responsibility to pressure the new Governor General, Sir Richard, to ensure that the constitution was reviewed and the part of the constitution which made it difficult for the indigenous people to not just participate in the electoral process, but to also go about their lives peacefully and normally was jettisoned for something much more welcoming and also achievable. Sir Richard, then pressured by the elites, was forced to review the constitution and then came up with a new constitution. So we had the Richard's constitution of 1946 being prepared in 1945, but came into effect in 1946. The Richard's constitution, like we said, the major change which this constitution had from previous constitutions was for the fact that it reduced the amount which was required to contest for public office from 100 to 50 pounds. Now we'll be looking at some other features of the Richard's constitution and also we'll see why it was jettisoned for another constitution. Now some of the features of the Richard's constitution were as follows. First was that it created an executive council. Yes, you predicted right. This same executive council was dominated by Europeans, but it, however, had some indigenous people in it. But then you can imagine that such kind of council, which was dominated by Europeans, would have Nigerians having little or no say in the decision-making process. Also, another feature was that the members of this House of Assembly would be nominated by native authorities. That is, after creating this House of Assembly, it put the hands of electing people who will become members of this assembly in the hands of locals. That is, it made people in various parts of the country to participate in the process of electing people who will represent them in the houses of assemblies. This may have been a welcomed idea. I mean, think about it. You create regional houses of assemblies where decision making would then be effective and carried out. And then you say that for people who would come into or serve in this House of Assembly, they will be elected by their people. It's a welcome idea and perhaps more commendable than anything that had come before it. But then it had a problem with it. The problem was that these regional houses of assembly did not have much say in the totality of the whole process. In other words, the houses of assembly may have had little say in deciding the affairs of their people, but it was only local. When it came to the national level, the executive council were the ones who made most of the decisions, and there were little or no presence of indigenous people in this executive council. So you could see that it was more like a game of who's more smarter. Okay, fine, you guys want to be represented in the decision-making process, right? Okay, it's not a problem. I'll give you the decision-making process. So here you have regional houses of assemblies. You have people in your area. We elect them to do whatever they want to do, however you guys want to do it. But when it comes to where it matters the most, you guys have little or no say. But then 
whether it is commendable that these houses were created is another question altogether. Lastly, on the features of this constitution is the fact that it reduced the amount, like we said earlier, it reduced the amount required to participate or to buy for electoral posts or offices from £100 to £50. I mean, this was perhaps commendable. But another problem was that it meant that those who could compete or buy for electoral offices would have to be the elite, those who were wealthy enough to cough up £50 to buy or purchase nomination forms and also buy for these offices. So these were some of the problems of this constitution. So the major problem was that the Executive Council was still dominated by Europeans, even though the constitution had reduced the amount required to buy for political office by indigenous people from 100 to 50 pounds. These and some other issues were the reason why the constitution was jettisoned. Now, after Sir Richard, the new governor general, who was Sir John Macpherson, when he assumed office, it seemed as if it was ceremonial for people to pressure a new governor general. Of course, you cannot blame them. They wanted a constitution which would reflect their realities and also capture their own challenges. John Macpherson came into office and despite the several improvements with the Richards constitution, drafted a new constitution. Now, this constitution then became the Macpherson constitution of 1951. But Sir John Macpherson did what his predecessors did not do when it was time to draft a new constitution. Sir John Macpherson had to organize an all-Nigerian constitutional conference. Now, by all-Nigerian constitutional conference, we mean all-Nigerian. That is, every part of the nation participated in the conference. Even those who were in faraway villages had a say in the conference. Why did he do this? Sir John Macpherson is often seen as the most compassionate governor general Nigeria ever had when you put him side by side with all other governors. And this is one of the reasons why he's considered such. Sir John Macpherson did not think about the fact that maybe power would be reduced or his authority would be reduced with time. But he was interested in ensuring that the people had maximum representation. So he organized an all-Nigerian constitutional conference where Nigerians would come together to decide on what it is the challenges are and how they can find ways to go about these challenges. So the constitutional conference was organized in 1950. After the conference was organized, the people had their say and also had their opinions. Now, when all of this was done, the conclusions which were arrived at from this conference was what then became the 1951 Macpherson Constitution. Some of the features of this constitution include that, one, the Macpherson Constitution made a provision for a federal legislature known as the House of Representatives. Yes, what you know now as House of Representatives was first created by the Macpherson Constitution. The House of Representatives basically does one thing, and that is to ensure that there is equal representation of all parts of the country, hence the House of Representatives. In other words, it is a house which contains representatives from all parts of the country who come together to participate in the decision-making process. Understood? Good. So you see how the Macpherson Constitution had to organize this all-Nigerian constitutional conference and by all Nigerian, we mean all Nigerian, not like his predecessors who would form or create councils for one purpose or the other and have it filled with or dominated with Europeans. Macpherson ensured that there was no interference with these conferences so that Nigerians would really know what it is that they wanted and how they could go about achieving it. Another feature of this constitution was that there were regional legislatures created. Regional legislatures were legislative bodies which were responsible for making laws for the various regions. That is, the North had a regional legislature which made laws for the North. The South also had 
regional legislatures which made laws for the South, and by the South we mean both East and West. This was important because don't forget that prior to the joining of Nigeria in 1914, these were totally different people with different worldviews, set of beliefs, cultures, and also way of thinking. So in order to ensure that there was less conflict among these various people, Mark Fassin decided that regional legislatures would be made so that people who know little or nothing about a region are not making laws for such region. Lastly, on the features of the Mark Fassin constitution was that the North and the West had a bicameral legislature. In other words, for the North and the West, there were two legislative bodies making laws for the region, while the East had just a unicameral legislative body, that is, just one body which made laws for the East. Perhaps you may ask, why did the North and the West have bicameral legislatures while the East had just a unicameral legislature? The answer is, I really do not know, but I'm guessing that it must have come from the fact that there were stiff resistance, particularly from this part of the nation. But then, how be it, the Mafasin constitution was way more better and a much more better improvement from all other constitutions that had come before it. But as you well know, there were still some problems with the Mafasin constitution. The throwing away or jettisoning of the Mafasin constitution may not have come from the fact that he had weaknesses, but for the fact that there were constitutional issues with the nation at the time. In other words, there were conflicts. The various regions of the country were not agreeing. For some reasons, they were not. They, they didn't seem to agree on what it is they wanted, despite the fact that they had come together just a few years ago to draft a new constitution. So there were conflicts, and these conflicts led to chaos in the nation. That is, there was no unity amongst the various regions. The North saw the South as a threat. The South saw the North as a threat. The reason behind this were so many. There were so many. There was lack of trust. Now, where there is no trust, things would hardly go on smoothly. So remember, these people didn't know themselves prior to 1914. But the question many people have always asked is, not knowing yourself should not be enough reason not to work together. I mean, human beings are renowned to the people who can make anything work if they just want to make it work. Perhaps they couldn't agree and conflict always ensued because they didn't have interest in making the nation work at the time. Now, while all this was ongoing, the then colonial secretary, Oliver Littleton, had to call the various. Now, before Oliver Littleton stepped in, they had accessed the situation. And then Oliver Littleton, who was the then colonial secretary, remember we talked about Lagos being a colony. Oliver Littleton then had to report to Britain that, look, conflicts were ensuing in Nigeria and something needed to be done fast if everything was to return to normal. After this, on the advice of Oliver Littleton, Britain then invited the major regional leaders, in other words, leaders of the various regions, were invited to London for a conference. Now, this conference was basically to settle the dispute amongst the various regions and find ways of them working together. Britain invited leaders of the various regions to London for a constitutional conference. Now, the purpose of this constitutional conference was to find ways of resolving the conflicts and the mistrust which was beginning to build up among the various regions. This conference then began in 1953, but held simultaneously both in London and Lagos. In other words, the conference, while it was ongoing in London, was equally ongoing in Lagos. How that happened, I have no idea. But history records that the conference held simultaneously in London and Lagos. Now, after these conferences, the resolution from the conference was then what we refer to as the Littleton Constitution of 1954. The Littleton Constitution of 1954 was basically as a result of the conflicts which had been building up amongst the various regions of the country. And the meetings or the conferences which held in London and Lagos, the generalizations or 
conclusions from these conferences were then drafted into a constitution and became effective in 1954. Some of the features of this constitution, known as the Little Two Constitution of 1954, include it introduced a federal system of government, which Nigeria continues to practice till date. So a federal system of government where there will be a central government which would administer the affairs of the nation was created. At that time, it was seen as the solution to many of the mistrust building from the various regions. Perhaps this worked at the time because for a federal government to be effective, it meant that the various regions would have to come together to vote an individual whom they probably felt represented the interests of the majority more. So it made everyone who was interested in contesting for the office of the president, for example, to go to the various regions of the country. Doing this would also help build trust among the various people. So at that time, it was a good move. Another feature of the Littleton Constitution was that it gave residual powers to regional legislators to be able to make laws without necessarily consulting the center. That is, regional lawmakers could make laws for their various regions without waiting for these laws to be approved by the center before it becomes effective and binding on their people. And lastly, it also established a Supreme Court and regional high courts in the various regions. That is, a Supreme Court or an apex court was established. Now, this court was the highest court in the country. That is, it was a court where if a matter is taken to and judgment is given, it cannot be taken to any other court in the country. No court was higher than the Supreme Court. But it also had regional courts where if people felt that the original courts did not give them their desired justice or did not rule in their favor or they were not pleased with the proceedings from the original courts, they could take the matter to the Supreme Court. Some of these features and many more were seen as a direct response to the building conflict and mistrust which was beginning to take over the atmosphere in Nigeria at the time. Now, at this time, these features were considered to be the solution to many of these challenges, as much as there were also some weaknesses or problems with this constitution, they also had some positives. I mean, for example, it created a federal system. The federal system ensured that a federal character would also be created. By federal character, we mean that it was a concept where every part of the country would be equally represented and no part would be left out of the decision-making process. So at the time of AIDS coming into law or becoming binding on the people in 1954, this constitution helped Nigeria maintain its nationhood. But after this constitution was enacted, problems continued. And many people began to feel that, okay, you know what? It is time where Nigeria should actually be thinking of becoming independent from Britain. In other words, it should be time when Nigeria would consider itself to be fully ready to take on its affairs from Britain. But it wasn't the case in every part of the country. A.G. Nahoro, who was representing his constituency or a Midwestern representative in a constitutional conference, suggested that Nigeria should become independent from Britain. But it wasn't welcomed by some people, particularly from those who came from the northern parts of the country. According to them, the nation was not ready for independence. Hence, they shouldn't seek or go after such. So when this happened, southern legislators or those who were in the south began to make mockery of the north. Now, the north did not take this lightly as there were reprisal attacks in Kano. Perhaps one of the first official riots in Nigeria was the Kano riots of 1956. Now, these riots were seen as a direct reply to the South because majorly Southerners were killed in the North. It was seen as a direct response to the humiliation which Northern legislators suffered in the hands of their Southern counterparts. But eventually, what would be would be, right? Yes, eventually Nigeria got 
our independence from Britain. Now, in 1960, Nigeria became independent. While a lot of people celebrated this, it meant that to now think about steering its own affairs was solely the responsibility of Nigeria. The question is, was this a wise or right move? At the point where there were several conflicts, crises building up, was it a good time for Nigeria to ask for independence? Some say, yes, it was a good time. Some will say, no, it wasn't because the nation was not ready. Perhaps how Nigeria has fared in the past several years would lend credence to the fact that a lot of people think that the nation may have just asked for freedom or independence from Britain so soon because many have argued that the nation has not done well since 1960. But whatever side of the divide you, you decide to pitch your ideas or terms with, the most important thing is that Nigeria gained independence in 1960. Now, how will it stir its own affairs? A new constitution was created or drafted to mark this historic celebration of the independence of Nigeria from Britain. But while Nigeria was said to be independent, it may just have been physically. Britain basically just moved their presence from Nigeria back to their base. But it didn't mean that Nigeria was totally independent from Britain. Why? Even though Nigeria had gained its independence, Britain still somehow ministered or administered the affairs of Nigeria from their base in Britain. However, they did this through proxies. By proxies, we mean they did this through representatives who were Nigerians. So the features of the independence constitution, which was drafted to reflect the new reality Nigeria had just stumbled itself into. We use the word stumbled because nowhere was it stated that the nation actually prepared for its independence. It was just a series of, ah, let's have independence, arguments and counter-arguments until the nation was given independence. But the nation was not given independence because lives were lost or they fought tooth and nail to gain their independence. In fact, it was at the discretion of the Queen of England to give Nigeria independence. So after the whole idea was raised for Nigeria's independence, she thought about it. I was like, okay, what would it take? Okay, give them independence. What would happen? Okay, we'll just rule them indirectly. And then she granted Nigeria independence. But what followed after may have given way to the fact that it was not a right choice to make. But some of the features of the independence constitution of Nigeria are as follows. The constitution created a dual national executive. By dual national executive, we mean that the executive arm of government had a head of state in one person and the head of government in another person. The head of state was actually still the Queen of England, but she had a ceremonial head of state who represented or acted in her capacity, the Notana. Tafawa Balewa was appointed the ceremonial head of state, while Namdi Azikiwe, the Easterner, was appointed the governor general and head of government of the new Nigeria, or Nigeria, which just gained her independence. Another feature was that provisions were made on how anyone who was interested in becoming a Nigerian citizen can acquire the status of a citizen. That is, the constitution made provisions for how or processes and steps which one needs to follow to become a Nigerian. That's for those who wanted to become Nigerians. And lastly, it also made provisions for the supremacy of the constitution. That is, the supremacy of the constitution means that the constitution is binding on every affairs of the nation, be it on the people and on government. Prior to this, there was no supremacy of the constitution as it could be changed at will or whenever people felt that, okay, this particular constitution does not reflect what we want it to, so let's change it. So the processes were basically easier before the 1960 independence constitution. When this constitution came into effect, it made sure that the constitution was to be supreme. That is, it was to be binding on the affairs of everyone and also must always be obeyed and 
there were strict penalties put in place for the violation or disobedience of the provisions made in the Constitution. So far in our lesson, we've been talking about the fact that the pre-independence constitutions of Nigeria had a lot of weaknesses, and this was why they were being changed from time to time. But we also mentioned some positives from this constitution. One of such was that the Richard's constitution, for example, reduced the amount required by Nigerians to vie for political office from 100 pounds to 50 pounds. A lot of them were. But in your own spare time, I'd like you to take out time. We've mentioned some features of this constitution, but we couldn't mention as much as we should have because of time. But I would like you to take out time, read up on the features of these constitutions and also see for yourself why these constitutions at one point or the other were not possible to see Nigeria through to her desired end anymore and had to be changed. Now, after you've done so, compare each of these constitutions and see which Nigeria can actually go back to, to maybe pick a few points or provisions from to meet some of its current challenges. In the course of our lesson, we discussed how Britain conquered Nigeria and then amalgamated the country. And then also we said that Frederick Lugard was the first governor general of Nigeria who joined the Southern and Northern Protectorates. And we went on to talk about the pre-independence constitutions of Nigeria. We mentioned the Frederick Lugard constitution the Clifford Constitution, the Richards Constitution, the Little Constitution, and the Independence Constitutions as pre-independence constitutions of Nigeria. Also, we looked at some features of the constitutions, and we said that the Clifford Constitution of 1922 introduced the first electoral system in Nigeria, while the Richards Constitution of 1946 created the first regional houses of assembly in Nigeria. Also, we said that the Mafasin Constitution of 1952 introduced a unicameral legislature for the eastern part of the country, while it also introduced a bicameral legislature for the northern and western parts of the country. And lastly, we said that the Independence Constitution of 1960 made provisions for the supremacy of the Constitution. Let us test our knowledge on what we've learned so far with these questions. Question one. Which of the following pre-independence constitutions made provisions for the supremacy of the constitution? Option A, the Macpherson Constitution of 1951. Option B, the Independence Constitution of 1960. Or Option C, the Clifford Constitution of 1922. The correct answer to that question is option B, the Independence Constitution of 1960 was the first constitution which made provisions for the supremacy of the Constitution. Question 2. Dash pressured Sir Hugh Clifford into drafting a constitution for Nigeria in 1922. Option A. The Nigerian Educated Elites. Option B. The West African Congress. Or Option C. The Colonial Secretary. The correct answer to that question is option B. The West African Congress was the body which pressured Sir Hugh Clifford into drafting a new constitution for Nigeria. We have come to the end of this lesson. I hope you had fun in the process. Until I come your way in our next lesson, be good, stay safe, and bye-bye.